Okay, brain tumors. Gets you thinking right. Definitely a topic that makes you stop and listen. We're diving deep into this new journal article all about brain tumor MRIs. In dogs and cats, right. You got it. Essential for any vet who wants to really stay on top of their game in neurology. For sure. And this article doesn't mess around. It really digs deep. It's like they sat down and said, Okay. Here's your roadmap for understanding these crazy complex brain images. It emphasizes this standardized, systematic approach. Yeah, they really hammer home that consistency. Which is so important for accurate diagnosis, right? Absolutely. You don't want to be like... They make a great point right off the bat. Yeah. MRI, it's the gold standard yeah. for diagnosing brain tumors. Yeah. You know, it might seem obvious, but yeah. it highlights how important it is to have rigorous protocols to make sure we're being accurate. Right. Because you can have the fancy equipment, but it really. if you're not using it... Garbage in, garbage out, as they say. Exactly. Yeah. So they specifically recommend a 150 millimeter field of view for canine brain MRIs. What does that even mean? So think of it like setting the zoom on your camera. Okay. You want to make sure you're capturing the whole picture. Got it. You don't want to miss those crucial details by being too zoomed in. You got it. Okay. So we've got our canine patients covered. Right. What about our feline friends? Yeah, great question. Cats, obviously, smaller brain size. They need special treatment. Do they need a different field of view? They do. They recommend smaller fields of view for cats. <laughs> okay. Because of the smaller anatomy and thinner slices. To really enhance that image clarity. Exactly. It's like adjusting your approach based on you know, the unique characteristics of each patient, which I think is really important. Absolutely. Every patient's an individual. Right. Exactly. And to really understand these images, we need to break down the different MRI sequences. Okay. Think of each sequence like a different lens that we can use to examine the brain. Ooh, I like that. And each lens reveals different aspects of the tumor. Okay. So we've got all these different lenses. Let's break it down. Let's do it. Which lens are we using first? So we always start with T1 weighted images. T1W. Got it. These are like the foundation of our analysis. Okay. They show us the anatomy of the brain in sharp detail so we can pinpoint exactly where that tumor is located got it. in relation to all the key structures. So T1W, get in the lay of the land. Exactly. Okay. What's next? Next up, we've got T2 weighted images. T2W. If T1 is about anatomy, T2 is all about highlighting those abnormalities. Okay, so T1, normal, T2, abnormal. Exactly. Wow. These images are really good at detecting edema, which often comes along with brain tumors. Edema, so like swelling in the brain. Exactly. It's like turning up the contrast okay. to make those problem areas really pop. So we can really clearly see what's going on. Exactly. Okay, cool. What else? Now, one fascinating detail the authors point out is this thing called the dural tail sign. Dural tail sign. The dural tail sign. Sometimes visible on post-contrast T1 weighted images. Okay, post-contrast T1WL. Imagine, it's like a subtle thickening yeah. and an enhancement that kind of trails away from the tumor, like a tail. Oh. Uh, and it's in the name dural tail sign. So this looks like a little tail coming off of it. Exactly. Okay, and what does that tail tell us? That little tail can be a really valuable clue for differentiating certain tumor types. Oh, wow. For instance, if we see a dural tail, that often points towards a meningioma. Meningioma. Which is a tumor that arises from the membranes surrounding the brain and spinal cord. Okay, so that one little detail can tell us so much. It's like piecing together a puzzle, right? Exactly. Each sequence gives us another piece of the puzzle. Puzzle. It helps us figure out what kind of tumor we're dealing with. Exactly. This is so cool. And speaking of puzzle pieces, let's talk about contrast agents. Okay, contrast agents. I feel like that's always like the... The cool stuff. Yeah, the cool like sci-fi part of it, mm. you know. Yeah, they might sound fancy, but their job is actually pretty straightforward. Okay. Think of contrast agents like highlighters for the brain. Yeah. They enhance the visibility of blood vessels and areas of abnormal vascularity, which makes tumors stand out more clearly. So it's like when we're looking at the images, it helps us know exactly. what's normal and what's not normal. It helps us differentiate, That's especially in those tricky cases where it might be hard to tell on those non-contrast images. Right, right, especially when those lines are blurred. You got it. So they recommend a specific contrast agent. They do. They recommend a gadolinium-based contrast agent. Gadolinium. At a specific dose and timing for the best results. Okay. Remember, consistency is key. Right, right. They suggest administering it intravenously at 0.1 millimolc. Okay. 
and waiting three to five minutes before you take those images. So let it like get in there and do its thing. Exactly. Let it circulate, highlight those key areas. And then this technique of subtracting the pre and post contrast images. Oh, that's a clever trick. What is that? What is that all about? So imagine you have two photos that are almost identical. Okay. By subtracting one from the other, you can highlight even the smallest differences. Cool. It's like a digital magnifying glass okay. for spotting those really subtle clues. To see if anything's changed. Exactly. Or if there's anything we missed. You got it. Very, very cool. Especially helpful for those tumors that like to blend in with the surrounding brain tissue. Sneaky little tumors. Exactly. So we've got all this information from our different sequences. We've got the contrast studies. Right. Now we have to interpret it all. That's the real challenge. Right. That's the hard part, right? It is, and that's where that systematic approach comes in. Okay. They provide a framework for analyzing those key tumor characteristics, like a detective's checklist. Okay, I love a good checklist. Who doesn't? Give me that checklist. First things first, we've got to figure out where that tumor's coming from. Is it intraaxial, meaning yeah. it started within the brain tissue itself? Okay. Or is it extraaxial, meaning it started outside the brain, like those meningiomas we were talking about? Meningiomas, right. So that's the first thing, figure out where it started. Exactly. Intraaxial or extraaxial. Okay. And then what's next on the checklist? So we've got that first clue figured out. Right. Intraaxial versus extraaxial. And then we move on to the tumor shape. Is it nice and round, well-defined? Or does it have kind of these irregular, almost like finger-like projections? Oh, interesting. So the shape itself can tell us if it's like behaving aggressively or not. Exactly. A well-defined round tumor. That might mean it's a less aggressive growth pattern. But those irregular shapes, those often mean we're dealing with something more aggressive. Makes sense. It's like spreading out. Exactly. Like sending out little tendrils. And then we look at the margins, oh, yeah. the borders of the tumor. The margins, right? Yeah. Are they sharp and well-defined? Okay. Or are they kind of blurry and indistinct? So sharp would be better. Sharp is usually better. Sharp is good. Sharp usually means slower growing, less invasive. But those blurry, indistinct margins, that often suggests it's actively invading those surrounding tissues. Yeah, it's like pushing into those areas. Exactly. It's fascinating how these little, like, visual cues can tell us so much. It really is. Okay, so we've looked at the shape. We've looked at the margins. What's next? Next up, we've got to consider... Signal intensity. Signal intensity. Remember how we talked about how T1 and T2 images highlight those different tissue characteristics? Yeah, they each give us a different piece of the puzzle. Though. Exactly. Right. So we compare the tumor's brightness on these images to normal gray matter, and that gives us clues about its composition. Okay, so like brighter means. So if it's brighter than the surrounding tissue on a T1 weighted image, yeah. we'd say it's hyper intense on T1? Hyper intense. So that means bright. Hyper intense equals bright, yeah. That could mean there's some interesting stuff in there, like blood products from a hemorrhage mm. or maybe a high lipid content. Okay, interesting. What if it's darker? So darker would be... We call that hypointense. Hypointense, got it. And what does that tell us? Could be a whole different ball game. Might mean high cellularity, meaning it's just packed with cells. Oh, so that could be a bad sign. Yeah, it could be more aggressive. Okay. Don't forget about contrast enhancement. Right, right. Our friend, the contrast agent. How much does it enhance and in what pattern? Okay. Okay. It can tell us even more about its vascularity. Okay. And about the blood-brain barrier. Is the blood-brain barrier still intact? Exactly. So if it enhances really strongly, does that mean, like, it's got a lot of blood flow? That's often what it means. Okay. Highly vascular. Which would be important for treatment. Oh, absolutely. Some therapies work better on highly vascular tumors. Okay, that makes sense. So we're building this whole profile, like a fingerprint almost. You got it. Now, we got to watch out for signs of trouble. Okay, trouble, like... Like Mass Effect. Mass Effect. What is Mass Effect? Think of it this way. You've got this tumor, right? Yeah. And it's growing, like an expanding balloon inside the skull. Oh, no. As it gets bigger and bigger, it starts to push on those important brain structures. Oh, so it's not just the tumor itself. No, it's the impact it's having. It's the pressure, yeah. Exactly. Okay. And that pressure, that can really mess with their function. So depending on where it is. Location, location, location. Right, and the size. It could be really bad news. Wow. This mass effect is... No joke. Not at all. The article actually has this really helpful illustration, shows a mass effect in action. Oh, interesting. What does it show? You see this large, irregularly shaped mass 
right in the forebrain of a dog and it's pushing everything out of the way. They say this kind of significant mass effect often means we need to intervene quickly. To like relieve the pressure. Exactly. Wow. Okay. So mass effect, definitely something to keep an eye out for. Definitely. We're also looking at paratumoral edema. Okay. Edema, that's the swelling we talked about earlier. It right. The swelling around the tumor. Okay. So why is that important? Because it can tell us how the tumor is behaving. Okay. If there's a lot of edema. Yeah. Could mean it's a more aggressive tumor. Aggressive in what way? It means it's disrupting the blood-brain barrier, causing all that fluid to leak out. Oh, so it's like breaking down the barrier and the fluid's just going everywhere. Exactly. Okay, so more edema is generally not a good sign. It's a red flag for sure. Okay, got it. The article actually has a table, breaks down the different edema patterns you see with different brain tumors. Oh, interesting. Like high-grade gliomas. Those are known for being aggressive, and they often have a ton of edema. Okay, so that makes sense. If it's aggressive, it's going to be causing more disruption, more swelling. That's exactly it. And by reading those signs, we can make the best choices for our patients. Right. It's all about interpreting the signs. Exactly. So sometimes, even with all the clues, it's still tough to figure out exactly what kind of tumor we're dealing with, right? Yeah, it's not always a slam dunk. Right, because they can look similar on the MRI. Exactly. The imaging characteristics can overlap. Making it tricky. It's like trying to solve a mystery where all the suspects have alibis. Right. Right, exactly. So the authors actually dedicate a whole section to this. Oh, they do? Yeah. They talk about how important it is to consider all the information we have, not just what we see on the MRI. Right. So it's not enough to just look at the images in isolation. Isn't that we deep? need the whole picture. Like, we talked about how a strongly enhancing extra-axial mass often means meningioma. Right. That was one of our clues. But sometimes, gliomas can be sneaky. Okay. They can also have strong enhancement. Oh, wow. And even mimic that dural tail appearance. Oh, no. So they can look like meningiomas. They can be real tricksters. So how do we figure it out, then, when the images aren't enough? That's where the art of veterinary medicine comes in. Okay. We've got to use all our skills, all our knowledge. So it's not just about the science. It's about connecting the dots, right? Uh, Looking at their clinical signs. Okay. Their history, even their breed. Oh, right. Some breeds are prone to certain tumors, aren't they? Exactly. So we're putting together this whole puzzle. Right. But sometimes we're missing a few pieces. And we have to use our experience to fill in those gaps. That's a good way to put it. And the authors, they give us some help with this, right? They do. They have this really helpful table, outlines all the common differentials. Differentials mean, right. other possible diagnoses. Okay, got it. So, for example, say you've got a young dog homogeneously enhancing mass in the cerebellum. Okay. Could be a medulloblastoma, but it could also be lymphoma. Wow. So even with all the information from the MRI, it can still be a tough call. Sometimes it is. Wow. This has been incredibly eye-opening. Glad to hear it. It's amazing how much these scans can tell us. It's like a window into the brain. It really is. And it's not just about the diagnosis. Right. It's also about guiding treatment. Exactly. And monitoring how the patient's responding. The authors talk about using follow-up MRIs to see how the tumor is doing after surgery, radiation, or chemo. So we can see if it's working. Exactly. We can see if it's shrinking, staying the same, or, unfortunately, getting worse. And that helps us make decisions about what to do next. Exactly. It's about giving them the best possible care. This has been an amazing deep dive. My pleasure. So much valuable information. Glad you found it helpful. From Vet Neurojar, keep those minds inspired, hearts light, and tails wagging.